Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jason, and I'm a Web Orders bookseller at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to PNP Live. Uh, we'll drop a link in the chat shortly so you can buy today's book straight from PNP. We're offering $5 flat rate shipping on all orders, or you can pick your book up in person at any of our three store locations. <clears throat> you can ask tonight's author a question by clicking on Q&A, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. Well, while we'll try, try to get to everyone's questions, we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Ian Spinonius is a veteran of the DC music scene, having performed and recorded with Nation of Ulysses, The Makeup, Chain and the Gang, and many others, and independently under the aliases David Candy and Escapism. He was the host of Soft Focus for BBS TV, and has published several books of social and cultural criticism, including Supernatural Strategies for Making a Rock and Roll Group and Censorship Now. His essays focus on topics ranging from the socio-psychological effects of the mother-father dynamic between the US and the USSR to the effects of real estate trends on the development of music genres. Tonight, he joins us to discuss the expanded reissue of his first collection of essays, The Psychic Soviet. Joining Ian is Johnny Temple, publisher of Akashic Books, who are responsible for the expanded reissue of the Psychic Soviet, and bass guitarist in bands Girls Against Boys, Soul Side, and Fake Names. Uh, please welcome Ian and Johnny to PNP Live. Gentlemen, the screen is yours. Thanks, Jason. Uh, thanks to you and to Brittany, Liz, Alan, and everyone at Politics and Prose, one of the country's truly great indie bookstores. Please buy at least one or two books uh, from Politics and Prose after watching this event. We hope you will buy Ian's book, The Psychic Soviet, but any book at all will support Politics and Prose as well as authors and publishers. Bookstores, as you probably know, are really struggling right now, so please buy in. Uh, I'm very pleased today to be speaking with Ian Sfinonius. Uh, with this new reissue of The Psychic Soviet, Akashic is now the publisher of all three of Ian's books and I'm very happy about that. So, moving right along, Ian, did you make the Psychic Soviet this small? This is like a regular size book, and, and, and this is the Psychic Soviet. Did you make it this small so that it would be easy to hide? Um, well, before I answer this question, Johnny, I'd like to um, thank Politics and Bros for having both of us. And, um, I'd really like to thank you for agreeing to speak with me about the book. I knew that you were one of the few people who may have really read it thoroughly. Um, and, uh, and I just wanted, you know, a kind of someone with a thorough understanding of the, the nuances, the, uh, you know, each apostrophe, the, uh, the, uh, you know, I, you know, just every aspect of the psych Soviet. I think you know it intimately, you know about the uh, choices made for the paper, the binding, the book cover, because as you said, it is a small book. And, uh, and you know, they say the medium is the message. Well, in a lot of ways, with the psychic Soviet, the medium is the message, meaning the way in which the information is imparted, not through the words or the word choice, which are almost irrelevant, but rather through the size and the sturdy book cover and the, the you see how this book doesn't hair? It doesn't hair. This book is a really sturdy book. It can fit right in the inside jacket pocket of any suit and, um, which is great because it can protect one from uh, bullet wounds, from trunnion bludgeoning, and um, you can even use it to cover your face if you're being tear gassed. That's right. This book is ready made for the epoch that we find ourselves in, which is a new kind of street battle, street fighting, apocalyptic landscape. So yes, the size is very important. It was um, chosen in a different era, but it's uh, even more relevant right now. So thank you very much. Thank you. 
in your essay in the book, Time is Money, you reveal yourself to be a sort of combination soothsayer, prognosticator, and harbinger. In the essay, you discuss how in our culture, time is indeed money. Can you talk a little bit about where culture falls in the time money conundrum? Well, this is interesting. This is um, one of, you know, this is an overlooked essay in this book because people typically focus on the Cold War aspect of the Soviet Soviet for obvious reasons, um, which is the initial essay. This is actually like 14 essays, I think, or maybe 18 or maybe more. Anyway, it's quite a few essays, maybe 23 actually. So, um, so, and each one, they're linked maybe thematically. There's some similar motifs, but each one is an original idea, uh, which can stand alone. So you could, you know, maybe take each chapter and actually, I mean, a lesser author might take each chapter and turn it into a kind of, you know, book um, of its own, but no, because uh, Akashic books and uh, the author believe in value for the money, we've instead taken what another author, like some, I don't know, cultural critic, like, like uh, I don't know, um, music critic who's popular right now, like, I don't know, who's somebody who, uh, you know, who's some snake oil salesman out there in the public sphere? Can you think of anybody? Oh, I think we need our audience to help chime in to, to identify the, uh, <laughs> anyway, I think one of those authors might have made 23 books out of what we made out of just one book. Um, and oh yeah, Time is Money, yeah, so anyway, Time is Money, it's one of my favorite essays in the book, and it's all about music as a time-based medium, as opposed to, you know, collage, watercolor, etchings, lithograph, letterpress, all those things can be glanced at and understood by the, the big six. Sure. That's the big six you just named, I think. I'm sorry. What? The big the big six. Yeah, that's, the big, yeah, that's the big six of visual arts, yeah. But um <laughs> the lively six. So but music and film are time based medium and uh media rather or something i don't know and uh and you know you really have to spend time with them and because of that because in our culture which is you know obsessed with um with uh conden you know condensing the time that it takes to perform the function um uh th that means that music and film are you know they're i don't know they're they're really valuable they're very valuable things because they take so long to consume right but um, but anyway, I, I don't know. It, uh, oh yeah, your question was about culture, time and culture. And I don't know, I don't really have an answer. That's quite all right. Here's one for you. <laughs> I think we're getting a little bit. So just so you guys know, we're more conversations than, uh, than my peer. Were you a precocious child with a large vocabulary? Um, in, in my era, there wasn't really childhood. There were just people just went straight into the factory. Children were typically reared so as to provide free labor on the farm or have just another paycheck at the factory. And so I, I don't really know about what people call childhood, which is a kind of exalted state of innocence. Fair enough. Fair enough. As you discuss in the new afterword to the 2020 edition uh, of The Psychic Soviet, the book has been banned in some regions. In fact, all three of your books, and I know this as your publisher, all three of your books have been banned widely across Northern Canada, Northern Europe, and Northern Australia. Does your music get banned internationally yeah. as well? Um, um, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I I don't know because I I just I don't really read the the day the trade dailies, so I'm not sure, you know I can't keep up with the uh, with the you know the foibles of critics, but it is roundly ignored. So in a sense, that's a kind of censorship, or it's a kind of that's a kind of censorship. You know, if the reviewers don't write about it, and the, then the festival 
programmers who, you know, don't book you, and you're essentially banned, you know, but, but it's a kind of like, it's a low-key censorship. I see. And a, a real, an old-fashioned censorship and a book burning, that would be highly welcomed, you know. No. Great. All right, so <clears throat> backing up a couple steps to something you said a moment ago, or something that you referred to, in a recent public forum, you told me that your favorite punctuation is the semicolon, but you didn't explain why. So here today at this event with Washington DC's great politics and prose bookstore, can you for the first time reveal what it is that is so alluring to you about semicolons? I guess, you know, you, you just, you know, you can kind of go on indefinitely with a semicolon. You just seem really great. So they, they extend life. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So actually, yeah, I, I do want to acknowledge all the viewers who came in who um, who joined us today. I think it's a very exclusive event. I think only one billion people are allowed into this forum, and I I would um, I just want to uh, welcome everybody. I wish I wish I could see them. It seems weird that we're having this conversation, but we can't see the people that we're addressing. You, you believe that there's actually an audience? Yeah. Well, oh, yes. I know that there's an audience. There's an audience, and I think, um, you know, anonymity can be fun on the internet because it gives you a certain, you know, kind of, you know, we all become supernatural sprites in some kind of way, uh, poltergeists. But, um, but in other situations, people want to be in the room. And I think it would be it would be so great if we could if they could be in the room with us. I mean, my room is infinite. It's blue. It goes on forever. Do you get what? It's good to be in the room where it happens. That's what that's what I have to say. <laughs> but but anyway, you know, we wish that we could. Because, you know, when people raise an eyebrow or, you know, or, they're, or they like shake their head and mutter in disgust, then we can know, you know, how to sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, ingratiate ourselves and our opinions to those people. But without with this kind of, we're just sort of, I don't know. I mean, I, this forum was initially designed, what, what was this designed for? It was designed for astronauts. Like yeah, who also don't have a visible audience. Yeah, well, they're talking to this maybe some alien space life that maybe doesn't even have a you know a corporal form. Okay, you know, they've been playing this music to the cosmos for decades now, you know, and. I'm really glad that I'm not one of the composers who's chosen, uh, you know, to be thrown into the into the Milky Way, because um, I mean, there's just you know you don't get any response whatsoever. It must be really uh, demoralizing. Speaking of demoralizing, right-wing demagogues have criticized this essay collection for a wide variety of reasons. One pundit called the book Marxist Dreck and a state governor who I can't mention for legal reasons banned it from all three of his state's bookstores. <clears throat> People who are familiar with your whole body of work understand the nuance of your writing, but for Fox News at all, what do you think is pushing their buttons so hard? I mean, I, like I said, maybe the, the smell, feel it feels menacing and i think everybody right now wants to be armed with a little bit of menace and that's why i urge everybody to go to uh or akashicbooks.com and join us in the uh, uh in yielding this uh very potent symbol of uh, rebellion. 
All right, so I realize that it's frowned upon by in bourgeois society to discuss this, but since you are one of the only people brave enough to take a position in your essay, Seinfeld, Seinfeld Syndrome, can you explain to our viewers how Seinfeld almost wrecked America's cities? Well, um, there's a chapter that, you know, I feel like if I explained it, um, I might not do it justice. But essentially, um, it talks about, you know, the use of media as a kind of commercial for a proposal for, you know, behavior, mass hysteria, consumerism. And uh, that Seinfeld was instrumental in um, the, this kind of makeover of America's urban centers. So, uh, but, but I think that it would be best for the, re the viewer to read it themselves. If they, if they get really close to the screen, I'll turn the pages for you. We could take a, about a seven minute pause for you to flip the pages for the readers. Okay. And for the viewers. Are you tell you? Yeah, yep, very good, okay. Excellent. All right, I'm going to take a screenshot of you. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I have... You get the point after the first couple sentences. Yeah, the first couple sentences are crucial. Um, I have just a couple more questions and then we can move to some questions from the audience. I see there's already a queue of questions, which is nice. But audi audience members, please just send them. So I think that Johnny is going to mediate the questions from the audience so that um, because, you know, I'm, I don't know. What is it could be very embarrassing if these questions come to you unfiltered. Exactly. Yeah. I don't publish <laughs> authors and then publicly annihilate them. What's that? It would really be, uh, yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't really suit someone in my uh, stature. Mm -hmm. Definitely. In their own questions. So, so, Ian, the only bone. The only significant bone I have to pick with the psychic Soviet is the essay, The Bloody Latte, in which you viciously condemn the role that coffee plays in our society. For me, personally, if I can't have a cup of coffee in the morning, I have no reason to get out of bed. I, I, I have no reason to live. So please tell me, what's the fucking problem with coffee? Well, <laughs> Well, you know, there's lots of ways to live, you know. I mean, I guess the New York Times has been, kind of, you know, uh, they've been exhorting the population to have, you know, a midday cocktail, a martini, a uh, free martini lunch. You know, there's a sort of, a, uh, you know, so there's a lot of reasons to live. And every epoch chooses, you know, their own, you know, or every culture. So, for example, the British, you know, they used to love tea, you know, when they were, when they had their grip on the subcontinent. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, the Americans, they love coffee because it's, uh, it's just a kind of, uh, it's a kind of magical, it's an exponent of imperial conquest. So, you know, I think that uh, if you didn't, you know, I, you know, it's not, you know, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I had a coffee here two once. I think it's pretty good. It's brave of you to admit. <laughs> but I'm just, uh, you know, the, the essay is more just uh, exploration of uh, why we have this affinity, you know, culturally. I mean, I think that there's a lot of um, condemnation right now that people are, people you know, condemning one another, and you know, people are being held to very high standards in terms of, um, you know, their kind of can really measure up to our own idea, you know, our own ideals of, you know, who we're supposed to be. And because um, in, you know, in the computer age, uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think that um, anybody's going to really you know, measure up because it's only, you know, someone that ha somebody like Hal, the computer in 2001, you know, that would be a kind of, uh, you know, a person who could maybe measure up to the 
standards that people are asking. And um, I, I don't think it's always useful to condemn people for, you know, drinking coffee, but rather to explore why we have this affinity for this death liquid. Excellent. Okay. Um, I think it's a good time to move to some audience questions because there are some good ones. Okay, okay cool. Um, here is one. Excuse me. I don't actually need these glasses. It's just that's just a, st a style thing that I like to do halfway through my public appearances. Uh, Don Don Squires asks, "Where do you get your news, Ian? Or is it best to be uninformed?" Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, I think that. Uh, I, I mean, we're all, you know, informed and there's, you know, news all the time. I think, you know, if you're walking through the woods, you know, the sounds of the, the fauna and the flora, you know, there's a certain kind of news, you know, and if you tap into that news, then that could be your news source. Or you can, you know, or, you know, the, the New York Times can, you know, give you the kind of, the, they're, they're kind of run down or, you know, some, you know, I, you know, it's, it, it all it all depends, but I think that we can all glean, you know, what's happening in the world from whatever news source. I think that they all kind of coalesce in whatever way. Does that make any sense? Lots of sense. <laughs> um, one person is saying that it's a little hard to hear you, Ian. So maybe oh, speak sorry. louder. Is that better? Um, is that better? That is better, I believe. Um, all right, let me f find you a good question here. Can you, D Dustin Courier asks, can you comment on the new aesthetics of video chat and the different choices you you both made regarding this, i.e., realism ver versus aestheticized? Um, well, that's interesting. That. Um that this person identifies your choices as kind of this sort of faux doorway that you've created in the background, whereas they recognize that this kind of, that I'm standing at the edge of a cliff with my back to a cliff, and that this is actually a cosmic void. <laughs> Very I, I don't know. I mean, this is new territory for all of us. Um, I think that, um, you know, I would, I, I, uh, I think that, you know, if I was a conspiracist, I would wonder who had created a reality where all of our goods have to be delivered through drone aircraft from a mega corporation and that all of our interaction had to be you know, you know, mediated by another you know, computer corporation. So I, I don't know. I, I don't think we're getting a lot of choices with our, you know, I, I, I think that we're, you know, we're, we're being kind of corralled into some very, very flimsy choices. What do you think of that? I don't know. I, don't, I can't imagine that myself or any of our viewers would, would disagree with what you just said. Uh, Annie Nash asks, after the pandemic, this is a good question. And, and Annie, I hope you've read Ian's book, Supernatural Strategies for Making a Rock and Roll Group, um, because it's, uh, it's relevant to your question. Annie asks, after the pandemic, will there still be 600,000 bands? You know, there will always be any national, there will always be 600,000 bands because, uh, you know, there's a lot, a lot of them are just placeholders or fantasies and they're all, you know, living there, copyright protected, or just kind of, you know, squatting and waiting to assert their, you know, their claim over a name or a concept. And uh, I hope there are, I hope there's always 600,000 bands. Um, I, I do think that uh, the pandemic, um, as you are calling it, um, is, uh, I think this is a really good opportunity for us to talk about, um, you were saying that there's bookstores uh, and that bookstores in general are really, um, 
uh, having a hard time. And that um, recently, what we're we're sort of in the midst of a uh, uh, social movement, a real upheaval, and a kind of uh, questioning of all of the values of the United States of America and, and society in general. And um, and I think it's a really good time for us to all talk about a rent strike and you know sort of addressing, you know, very, very, you know, basic material needs for people, you know, phone bills and, you know, insurance and things like that, you know, because uh, after the pandemic, I mean, you know, is, is there going to be anything left, you know, that resembles anything that we like, you know, only these mega corporations, only these Silicon Valley institutions seem poised to survive. And, uh, and I think that the, uh, the violence in the streets and the mass protests and uh, the, the organization has to carry on and its scope has to become wider and we have to start addressing property. Uh, and that, so that's my, that's my answer, Annie Nash. And hello, Annie. Sticking on the theme of um values and ethics. Mark Masters asks, one section of the book is entitled Abolish the Family. Are you still in favor of this? Uh, the family. Well, you know, the family is, you know, it's an interesting idea because, you know, the modern family is quite new. It's coincides with the Industrial Revolution. And, uh, you know, before that, a family was a broader thing. Uh, and that's, you know, it's more a tribe. And, um, you know, so, you, you know, the, the family, the nuclear family, as we call it, you know, kind of, uh, it's, uh, it, you know, it, you know it's, it's all about this, you know, thing, you know, people, you know, it's about, you know, like I said before, you know, children were once kind of, you know, farmhands and, you know, they, they were sort of, you know, you know, produced to be laborers, you know. And now, um, you know, a child is a, is a different thing. You know, uh, now they're a, a beloved, they're a beloved uh, creature. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, you know, so I think the family will just uh, keep, you know, um, shifting, uh, you know, because now, you know, we're, we're going to be in this post-pandemic apocalypse, so who knows what form the family will take, you know. I, I mean, I, I don't know. We, we shall see what a family will be. Here's an interesting question. Uh, as interesting as the question is the fact that the person asking it is anonymous. Uh, uh, and um, you know what? I don't blame them. I'd be anonymous too. I'd be ashamed to ask that question. Yeah, this question. Uh, if events appear first as tragedy and then as farce, what comes after farce? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, Karl Marx said, history repeats itself. First is tragedy, then is farce. And he was talking about uh, the, you know, the Brum, the Brumar, whatever, right? He was talking about like, uh, Louis, you were talking about Louis Napoleon, I think, uh, who was the farcical leader of France, who led France to ruin against Prussia, um, and and created the German state. Really, the loss of France in the Franco-Prussian War led to. But um, but um, I don't know, play out right ball or maybe uh, or maybe oh it says my internet connection is unstable. We might be in for a little turbulence, people. There has been a little bit of turbulence. Uh... Well, I see there's a police helicopter circling. My
the oh, I see, you know, game. Covers. Yeah, it, it might be doing so effectively because your voice is breaking up a little bit more right now than it was more than usual. More, more than usual. More than usual. Um, that's that's that, where it came on to the police because of situations like this. There's another reason. Sticking. Okay, everybody's free to move around the cabin. <laughs> um, stick, sticking on the theme of revolutionary politics, Trevor Tyrell asks, as a revolutionary, are you in favor? This is a great question. Are you in favor of the decimalization of the calendar? Absolutely. Sometimes it's good to ask a question just to make sure, even if you think you know the answer. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I mean, it should be aligned with, you know, lunar cycles, I suppose, and you know, menstruation. It should really be all about, you know, the Earth. But so I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I don't know actually. I'm, I'm, I, you know, that's a good question, and I think I'm gonna have to do some study. I have to study with some druids before I answer that question effectively. Yep. Let's see. I had a question here. There's lots of questions. Um, oh, this is another good one. Another anonymous question. And for the other viewers, I don't think that we should assume that the person is cowardly just because they're anonymous. So no, they're shy. They might just be shy. Yeah, yep. Yeah. There's plenty of reasons why they might be anonymous other than cowardliness. Well, maybe at work. What's that? Maybe they're at work. Mm. So uh, if package tracking is correct, anonymous should be receiving their copy of the Psychic Soviet this week. What is the proper unpackaging ritual for this book? Mm. I think that, that, uh, that you have a good question, but I'd like to I, I think that um, you know you can only open the package that contains the psychic Soviet once. You only get one chance. So I would just do, do it tenderly, and maybe you know be very present. Beneath Mur Murthy asks, Ian, are you hiding in a bunker? A bunker. Well, you know, this is an interesting period, and a lot of people have likened it to childhood, to a kind of extended childhood, which is already an enforced state in the kind of consumer capitalist society, this kind of infantilization of humanity. So this pandemic is enforcing an already infantilized state, and um, are, you know, a lot of us, our only companions are this kind of, you know, mind numbing, you know, computer content, you know, so yeah, I'm, I, I am in a bunker. I'm trying to hide from all the, uh, from all the uh, detritus, the cyber detritus. All right. Uh, I think uh, we'll take two more questions before we wrap up. Uh, well, I'm like an old country star, and if, you know, I'll ask, I'll answer any question anybody gives me. We can be here all night. Okay, so maybe we'll take more than two. Well, yeah, the things are getting a little weird. Yeah. Also, I'm not like an old country star. <laughs> um. So. A non-cowardly anonymous viewer asks, a fantastic question, can the problems of intellect be solved by intellect? Oh, wait, what's the question again? Can the problems of intellect be solved by intellect? Oh, good. that's a great question. I mean, the intellect, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, at one point, the intellect was prized. 
but then in the 60s, there was this kind of examination of anarchism and the French theorist, Louis Proudhon, I think. And, you know, who really exalted a kind of state of savagery. And at that moment, eschewed the intellect in favor of a kind of raw, savage psyche. People were the id, unleashed, rampant, running through the jungle, in the words of Creedence Clearwater Revival. But sometimes we long for the intellect. Times like this, when a coherent conversation seems about as scarce as a big on a November afternoon. So I don't know if there, I don't know, you know, problems with the intellect, I guess the intellect, I don't know. I think that there's different kinds of intellect. So yeah, like maybe the problem of the intellect meaning, you know, like the computer programmer could be solved with some ethics, which could also be an intellectual exercise kind of creating an ethical framework for all this computer shit, you know, or, you know, so maybe yes, I think yes, but I don't know. I'm just talking. That was a very good answer. Um, Thank you. If I were judging the audience questions, yeah. I would rate that your top answer so far. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Cody Schwartz asks, Ian, how important was Sweden to your politics and upbringing? Sweden. Well, Sweden is an interesting case. I talked to a Swede, an older Swede, and I said, how did Sweden become such a welfare state? Why is it such an, or, you know, why did it become this kind of, you know, you know, what it was, which it isn't anymore, really, I don't think. But, um, and, and he said, well, three things happened. He said, three things happened. There was a labor movement, like in every country, but you know there was the revolutionary arm of the labor movement, and then the reform arm, and the reform people won. First, of all. second of all, it was unscathed by World War II, so the industry was left intact with this labor force that was reform-minded. And then third, he said. About a million really conservative Swedish people moved to America. Wow. <laughs> so, so anyway, I think that um, Sweden, a place like Sweden, a kind of very homogenous you know, monoculture with 10 million people, you know, it's, it's very. You know, thing to look at the models, you know, in Sweden, but it's, you know, it's not necessarily our model that we can follow. All right. Is it true that on August 11th, you're going to be doing a book event in which you are interviewed by Henry Rollins? That's the rumor. I heard that rumor. Bobby Sandoval wants to know what your favorite color is. Oh, wow. I, you know, I am a Gemini and it's very difficult for me to make a choice. So I can only say maybe, you know, pink and orange together. <laughs> That's a magical combo. <laughs> uh, Go Gozia Nawakowska Miller has a very interesting comment and question. Uh, I see that there is an audio book of the Psychic okay. Soviet. I see there's an audio book of the Psychic Soviet read by Ian. Does having the book read by read to you lessen the impact of the writing? And Ian, will you now become an audio book reader for anyone else like J.R.R. Tolkien or Marshall McLuhan? Well, J.R.R. Tolkien asked me. I might do it. But what, maybe... <laughs> No, I, you know, what I gotta say that um, I, I did read the 
audiobook, Lord of the Second Soviet, and I urge everyone to listen to it, but only after you read the book form of the Second Soviet. It might help you with some phrasing and nuances when you're trying to memorize the book, the Second Soviet, but really, I think that the book version might be the most and as far as doing other audiobooks, I would love to do them, but maybe um, maybe next time with like a flamenco guitar or some kind of rhythm, because it's very difficult to do and it just drives. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a poetic soul and I just need a little accompaniment. All right. For the question. Final question of the night. Anonymous asks, will you come back to DC once the pandemic is over or are you in LA permanently? Well, you know, I, I miss Washington DC a lot. I like getting on the bus. I like traveling on the bus and I like the bridges and I love the low swung architecture. And, and I love streets that are designed to mirror the constellation Isis. And uh, so yeah, I'm definitely gonna, I'm planning on coming back as soon as possible. But maybe not for good, but you know, just to you know press and flush. All right, I think that wraps us up with shaking hands for press and flush. That's the term for shaking hands. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a perfect note to end this event on. Um, yeah. Ian, thank you for speaking with me, Politics and Prose. Thank you for being a phenomenal bookstore. Thank you very much for everybody who tuned in to watch and listen. And uh, I'm sorry about any audio problems. Dealing with very imperfect technology, and it's probably because of the imperfect people who designed it. <laughs> All right, Jason, take it away. Uh, yeah, so if you don't mind, I have a question for both of you, and it is a question in two parts. Um, Johnny, you first. What are you reading now, and what are you looking forward to reading next? Uh, I've been reading like a maniac. Um, uh, and what I am reading now is uh, a Gabriel Talent novel called My uh, I, don't, I don't have the time to run to 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 run and go get it, um, but I will show you what I'm about to read. Uh, Gabriel Talent, my something like My Beautiful Sweetheart, but that's not the title of it. It's a phenomenal book. Um, and I'm about to read this book, How to Love a Jamaican. Right on, awesome. Um, but I've been reading actually more than ever during the virus and I've read just some preposterously good books. That's, that's great to hear. Ian, same question. What are you currently reading and what are you looking forward to reading next? Oh, gee, golly, wow. Well, you know, reading several books at once, which is the way I like to read. In fact, I, I think that everybody should be reading five, six books simultaneously. So right now I'm reading this kind of some old interview book with uh, the director, Pasolini. And I'm reading some, uh, this William Burr's book that I just got at a local bookstore. Um, called uh, the uh, Boy Scout, what is it called? You know, the, the revised Boy Scout manual, which I never, you know, the, yeah. And uh, and then I'm also, uh, <laughs> I'm also reading a uh, book about uh, Marcel Duchamp. And, uh, and, you know, I'm just, I'm just, you know, reading this and that, really. But, uh, I, you know, and, uh, you know, just, I like to read books, you know, sort of like somebody might graze a 
NASA, you know, a Mediterranean plate of food, you know. All right. Well, as a reminder to our audience, uh, you can buy today's book straight from PNP by following the link that we are dropping into the chat now. Um, and thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Ian, for being with us. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in tonight. And uh, stay well. Stay well read. Thanks. Bye-bye.